Good evening, welcome to Von Moth Presents Moths Ado About Nothing. Moths Ado About Nothing. Moths Ado About Nothing. Where we apply the revolutionary moth scale to classic and contemporary literature. Moths Ado About Nothing. Moths Ado About Nothing. Podcast contains mature content, spoilers, language, you have been warned. Welcome back to Matsudu About Nothing. I'm Jonathan Ian Manzer here with Scott Thurl. What's up? Stephen Ramosi. Howdy. And Veronica Hernandez. Hello again. And today we are doing A&P by John Updike. So we're going to do a round of <laughs> fire log lines starting with Scott. All right. This story is the anti-clerk. Stephen Ramosi. Or Ferris Bueller's Day On. And Veronica. Or Gilmore Girls on the Beach. All of those work. I'm not going to give a particular synopsis to this because it's a pretty, like, the narrative is pretty straightforward. And I'll leave that for introduction and body conclusion. But I just wanted to preface this. I was reading a uh, Graham Greene novel recently. And his introduction states how if the narrator is an I in a uh, first person in a story, uh, the reader will often assume that the first person is the actual author. And Graham Greene saying that this is unfair in the comedians because I have never been to Haiti and done any of this. But however, I feel that John Updike's protagonist in this story is probably John an, Updike. An XP for him, yes. <laughs> yes. A version Perhaps. of him, yes. And I got that sense throughout. I but did it as might well. not be a one to one to what really happened, but I feel that something similar to this happened to John Updike once upon a time. Mm. But to what that is, we're going to go with Stephen Mosey with the intro body conclusion wrapped into one. All right. Well, this is a pretty short story, and it begins with three girls walking into a store. The narrator is a teenage boy. I think it's said he's like 17 or something. 19. 18. I'm pretty sure it's 19. Wow. All right. Well, he's 19. Well, you go on, and I'll look it up for us. We'll find them. Actually, I believe it says he's about to turn 19, so... Mm. Scott, I, and Veronica are all... I, read the, <laughs> I remember reading the word 19, so... He works on an EMP. Uh, these three girls walk in in their bathing suits, and most of the story is about describing them as they wander the aisles looking for uh, one item. I guess from the item that they pick, which is pickled herring, they are supposed to be rich, or you're supposed to get the idea that they're rich. Kingfish fancy herring snacks in pure sour cream. Yeah. Mm. Is in fact what that it does is. sound fancy. And then they get yelled at by the manager of the store for being in their bathing suits. And no shoes. Yeah, well, no I, guess, I guess they had no shoes, but they did get service as they paid for the whatever the, the herring, and then walked. Uh, basically, had a little altercation, walked out. The main character decides to quit his job, or I, you know what? I don't even want to call him the main character. The narrator decides to quit his job, <laughs> and his boss tells him he's making a huge mistake, and he's like, "Screw you, boss!" Walks out, and that's it. I mean, there's not that much to it. A lot of the what's important about this story is. Stuff we'll talk about later, I suppose the themes, and probably even more importantly, the style. Yeah, it's more of a slice of life, which we'll get into, uh, but just to be clear, the line is, he's talking about his uh, co-worker, he's 22 and I was 19 this April. So, there you go. Glad we cleared that up. Well, fine. So, now we know. So uh, Anyway, the intro body inclusion, that, that, that was basically the wrap-up of it. Not very much happens. It's kind of this 19-year-old kid ogling... <laughs> three girls that walk into the store for a while and like kind of trying to pick apart their psychology without any other without without knowing anything other other than they're there in their bathing suits and kind of their you know he picks apart their body shapes mannerisms, and their yes. mannerisms and the way they walk and things like that but uh, not only to the girls he does that for every single person yeah he's straightforward ogling Sure. He's as every other male in the story is as well. But uh, he references the other types of characters who wander into sure. uh, the A&P, which I don't believe exists anymore. <laughs> uh, we should retell the stop and shop. It's gone and the way of John Updike. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Alrighty then. Uh, but yeah, oh, it, <laughs> it, it, it's certainly a slice of life, as you put it, mm. uh, Scott. And yeah, there's not much narrative in 
the way... It's almost like a shaggy dog story, but like, like kind of, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it, but there's not much narrative there to be had. I think that the important part of the story happens pretty much right at the end, which I liked. I liked I liked reading it. I, I enjoyed it all. There just isn't that much of a narrative flow. It's a lot of talking about descriptions of people and the store and the surroundings and kind of picking apart the way that people are acting and that type of thing, which is all interesting, but it's not per se a story. But here's the thing is that you're right. The important part or the important action in this story narratively is he decided to quit his job. This is the story of the direct causality that, that in a sense is the final uh, straw uh, that led him to quitting. Right. But you get the sense of his, I think more important, the disgruntledness that he has <laughs> yes. about him being 19 and this kind of, not even like, you mentioned Pleasant uh, the earlier, I think someone yeah. did, yeah. or maybe it was precast. But this isn't even the nice aspect of Pleasant This is the kind of lower middle class, low class type environment that the protagonist is stuck in. Mm-hmm. And it's his disgruntlement with the, uh, the house, house slaves, as he calls them, coming in with their hair curlers, uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, shopping. And the sheep the- pushing their carts down the aisle, yeah. etc. Mm-hmm. I mean, he sounds like any teenager with a job, really. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure that's anybody with a job. Yeah. Let's go ahead and correct that. Sure, but viewed to the light of a 19 year old as with well. Some, to some extent, but yeah, yeah, but yeah, you, get, you definitely get this feeling of like angstiness and like, I don't need to be here type of feeling where he's probably right. He probably doesn't need to be there. He's 19, whatever. He can go and get another job somewhere else or sure. whatever. But yeah, I, I mean, I guess that's not really. That's probably more of uh, another question that we're delving into at that point. Hmm. I mean, sure, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to touch on that a little bit later on, but as far as the intro of Body and Conclusion, yes, it was a little bit lacking. I think a bit meandering. And the and reason why of. I think that is, and I agree with you, Scott, is it, nothing really happens until the end. Although, and, and I'll touch on this a little bit later on, the description is pretty on point on a lot of points <laughs> and a lot of scenes in the story so i'm going to give it a two because while the story is light it's not really something that you're gonna stay up at night and think of wow that was that really touched me it's more of i just came home from work and this touches home the thing i might disagree with you about there is that if i were in high school and i had read this Mm. it's the kind of thing of like oh other people are as angsty and do the world the same way I do. I don't yeah, think this is that, but... written for us as the audience. I think this is written for younger, like, high school age. Maybe. Yeah. And I'm going to give it a two as well, although I can't really tell you exactly if intro body or conclusion were lacking. It's just that I don't feel that it was strong enough overall to warrant a three. If we had split these up, I might have rated it differently. But since we're rating well together, it's going to be a two. No, I agree. I think, I think a two is the correct score, if you will. Yeah. Uh, I'm also giving it that. Probably, I, I think I'm more clearly uh, can give you a reason why. I would say intro and conclusion are the strongest, and the body sort of like is there to hold it together. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the body is like, really just these guys watching yeah. and these girls yeah. walk up and down aisles. That's what you said. Yeah, exactly. I want to give it a two. I did enjoy reading it, but I don't know if the intro was enough to grab me. All right. I, actually, you know what? I, I will give it a two because I, I was I was interested after reading the intro. If just to find out where this guy's head, where this narrator's headspace was. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to give it, I'll give it a two. I did like it. Uh, the intro and body just kind of combined into, uh, as I guess, half a point each. Mm-hmm. I thought the conclusion was pretty good. Mm. Okay, we're on to themes with Veronica. I'm actually happy that I get to talk about the themes because as the only girl out of the uh, four readers on this podcast... I had a few things to say. Um, and the first line of the story is, in walks these three girls in, in nothing but eating suits. A few things. So throughout the story, you are the main character, the narrator, let's say, is the one that's describing the reaction of everyone around these three girls. Mm. And it's judgmental. And it is perverse, <laughs> certainly. I mean, society's idea of acceptable is clearly not being carried on by the three girls. They're walking in with no shoes, in bathing suits, 
in a town that's not too far from the beach, but not at the beach either. Yeah, to, I think he, the narrator outright right, to, makes that clear. To kind of allow them to be wearing this in public. We have men in the meat area, I think it was, that was... The meat counter dude. Yeah, he was ogling, essentially, the women, like the girls, walking away with their bathing suits and no shoes on. And the older women with their hair and curlers are taken aback by seeing this while they're doing their daily shopping and what have you. So I think it really touches on society's idea of what is acceptable, acceptable and what is not. And I really have a problem with that because what is and what isn't acceptable? Is it something that's acceptable if it makes everyone else around them well, comfortable? It's, it's relative, of course. You know, I, it, I think that's a huge theme in this story. Just to, before I let everyone else touch on these things, I think it also touches on the idea that everyone really is perverse. They're just better at hiding it. Some others, you know, more than others. People are assholes, yeah. And I know that. It's it's acceptable for a man to look at a young girl that's clearly underage, yet they are not being chastised for that. Would, would you say they were clearly underage in the story? I, I don't think it makes it clear. I, I never got that impression out in of it. In the story, the way they're described, it was a girl that mm-hmm. she would eventually grow up and be liked because she wouldn't become anything. Maybe, but I, I, I'm saying is I got the sense that he, they were around his age, so like 18, 19, 20. Something I like thought that. that they were younger because they seemed as okay. far as even their descriptions of their body, it, it was something where you're young, you're developing, maybe you don't realize that certain things may send wrong signals. But even that, the idea that you have yeah, to send it. the right signals, again, becomes what is acceptable and what is not. And who is to say what is and is not? I think that's a huge theme. Well, I think the antagonist of the story, if you want to call him that, the manager, uh, what's his name? Laurel Lengel, like Lengels. He is a the manager of an A and P. He is a Bible study teacher. He's a Sunday school teacher, yeah. Yeah. and he's not outwardly hostile. To, like he's not mean to these girls. He's just very firm. He is the person who, in society, who is supposed to set the standard for morality, or he views himself as that. So public bashing becomes yeah. acceptable. But, that's, that's another the, theme. That's, the thing is, everyone when he's chastising these girls for like you can't go out in public like that. Everyone else is kind of like gathers around to watch them get embarrassed. Oh, absolutely! They they and, are like, flocking great- to the conflict. I believe is mm-hmm. how he said it. The other thing is that we also touch on, I guess, acceptable behaviors that people aren't called on. In the very beginning of the story, there's a woman that apparently is considered a cash cash register watcher who ha- who is described as a witch about 50 with uh, rouge on her cheekbones yeah. and no eyebrows. And I know it made her day to trip me up. And the thing is that we've all encountered that person. Doesn't matter what you do, whether you're 15, 19, 50, and it doesn't matter what profession you are in, or if you're just a bystander in a store, we all know that person. When is it acceptable to bash a younger girl for not being embarrassed and not having to try and make everyone else acceptable or comfortable with the way that they carry about you know, their day or how what they're wearing? And then when it becomes acceptable for a person to look down and be rude and outwardly hostile against a register, a, a you know, a cash register well, attendant, whatever. I guess, let me ask oh. you this, Veronica. Do you think that the story is saying that that's okay, or do you think that the story is showing that it happened? I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying either way right now, because there are a couple parts of this story that where I was like, eh, that seems a little, like, off. But at the same time, I read this, especially because the ultimate ending of it is him quitting the main character or the not even again not the main character because i kind of see the the girls and especially queenie as he, as she gets called being the main characters of this but the narrator quits over this incident as to say like yeah you can take this shit and shove it basically <laughs> yeah so is that the is that the point of the story i think the point of the story is to depict that this is normal this this is depicting a day where a Thursday afternoon where it's not busy and this is just normal activity. This is a normal day to day. And I think that speaks volumes. This is okay. These actions 
this sort of attitude, this activity is okay, and yet so it's, let's, it's okay. Let's be clear. So you're saying that you think this story is saying that the way it's that, condoning is the way that we're asking Langle treated the three girls is okay. Yes. Okay. Wait, the story's condoning. Langle? No, society is condoning it. Right, but I guess I guess what I'm asking is so there, those are two different things, right? I guess what I'm asking yeah. is. Do you think the story is the story itself? is the story in the way that it's written condemning that because the ultimate consequence is that this guy, this kid quits his job and he's you know the kind of the voice of the story. I'm thinking. Well, may I offer a, uh, a? To me, I view this story as, in a sense, Bukowski light in a lot of ways of having a character looking at society where Bukowski is far far more cynical, and the main character of this story is cynical himself. But I feel that ultimately it's saying that, yeah, yeah, his defense of the girls was not necessarily an act simply for the fact of trying to um, like, bring down like this establishment. He's trying to impress them. That yeah. was his intent. But it, ultimately, I think the point was that it was a pirate victory. and uh, <laughs> yeah. But it, it is at the end that he loses his job. The girls are gone when he goes out, even though he quit in in a sense, in defense of them and in protest of it. And yes, while it's not necessarily, I think that the story itself is saying that it's condoning the society that is, uh, like, in a way, oppressing the girls or however uh, you want to describe it as. But it's saying that it's so ingrained that it is part of, it's something that's very difficult to beat in a way. I don't think it's condoning it, though. Even though the narrator, I, I I don't think they're they're saying that it's it's not right. I don't think that Updike really gets that point across. I don't think so. I think it's a theme, but I don't think that that's what he's saying. This unfortunately is yes, it is ingrained, but I don't think at the end when he does quit that it means that it's ne- necessarily a bad thing. I don't think that goes one way or the other. Maybe it's it's funny because uh, the you always a lot of interesting points and things I didn't even think of. My theme is going to be sort of small town boredom and like the the doldrums of living life there, and yes, a bit of the classism I think you brought up e as well. Right. But I just want to touch back on something because you made me change the way I thought this approach the story. I don't think they're un- I, I I don't mean to harp on this, but I'm going to. I don't think they're underage because at the end when he after he quits. You just said he's trying to impress them, right? Yeah. Why would he do that if the, the, the narrator himself thinks they are like underage? That makes it even more creepy if that in, is indeed the case. Yes. He's ladies, he says, I look around for my girls too. Like, that's just bizarre. Yes. Like, yes. I don't know. Again, that's why I, that's again. That's why I got that. In I my mind, underage. when I was picturing the characters, they were like his age, like equal to it. I'm still going to disagree with that, but again, I see where you're coming from. But at the end, I think it only supports. Either way. True, you're absolutely right. But I think that's what that's what I came right. away with it. But at All the right. same time, the fact that he did that just goes to show that, or at least I think supports what I'm saying, which is you might, I, everyone I has their own unacceptable, you know, social cues or you know, ways of thinking, whatever it is, and it's okay, sure. but. I mean, them. You know, I don't disagree on that point. I just, I don't know. I don't mean to nitpick it, but um, I'll just keep it broad then. I agree with both your points. Yeah, it's sort of like the ingrained hypocrisy of society and like uh, what we think is, in quotes, acceptable and is not and what you feel people should be embarrassed by again or not, etc. So, I believe, yeah, those are all themes contained within them. And I think it handled it pretty well overall, whether or not we split hairs over the details of it and so forth. But I, I think I will give it a one. At the end of the day. I'm going to give it a one as well. As will I. Yep. I will give it a one too. Okay, we're on to the antagonist. I think that the manager is a representative of... That mindset. His society. Yes. Uh, I agree he's with not only, like He is what a traditional leader of the community is. A, you know, <laughs> a, a store owner, a or at least wanna religious be. leader. But I think that... So whether you view, view Queenie and her two friends as... Uh, the, the protagonist, or whether you view the narrator as the protagonist, I believe that the store manager antagonizes both of them well enough, and again, like, again as representative of the community at large. No, I agree with that, and of course, my answer might go to is society, as represented by him, of course, as you just said. So sure. I think I agree with that, and uh, I, I think he embodies that quite well, and Updike does a good job of uh, sort of having this character espout those kinds of things, so I think it's a, pr- a pretty solid one, if not like a strong one. 
solid one for me for antagonist. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you, both of you. He uh, does a good job of being that kind of uptight uh, authority figure, and I will. Uh, yeah, I'll give, I'll give it, I'll give him a soft one. All right, solid one for me. And we're on to Scott with the protagonist. All right, so it's interesting that Steve brought up uh, just before earlier that you think the three girls are the protagonists. It, I, I, I think my case is going to be the narrator because it's all through his point of view, more or less. It's in first person, so I did this, I said this, I was watching them do that. So I'm going to take the stance that the main character or the narrator is, in fact, the main character. And therefore, yeah, he's kind of like your generic 90-year-old kid in a small town working a shitty job that he doesn't like middle of summer. And three chicks in bathing suits walk in. And, I mean, you that's how he descri- That's how his life is, and that's how it's described. And certainly I can relate to that. Or at least uh, I was somewhat like that at the time. I think we all somewhat were, at, except roughly around that point in our lives. So I think, yeah, he, he's kind of a dick, but not, like, too badly. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's, again, he, he's just a cynical, angsty 19-year-old working at the fucking AMP. Uh, I've yeah. had worse <laughs> thoughts about these strangers. <laughs> I agree with that. But, ha- however, I would say that the reason that I don't see him as a protagonist is that there's nothing that happens to him in this story. No, what do you mean? He quits his job. Yeah. He takes action yeah. based on the all the passive events that have <laughs> yeah. blown by him throughout the he makes story. A, he makes a narrative he decision. He's not, he's not the one who is being antagonized in any way. He's not the one who this story happens to. Not, this story happens to the I three girls. That, I don't know if I, he's being antagonized I'm, like in, nebulously by Lango. Like, you it's know, like, it's implied that he's... It's like if you, if you called... What, what, are, what are their names? The Watchers, like the protagonists of Green Lantern. <laughs> I can uh, I offer a rebuttal to that. Right, go ahead. Sure. So, and it's built off the supporting characters. So there's uh, his fellow catch register attendant. Or Stokesy, or his buddy. Yeah, Stokesy. Who he's basically like, basically says, this is me in two years from now. And there's no difference between us except that he has a wife and kids now and is still working this job I am. He, he's been passive to all of these events around him until he finally decides to take a action and make a choice. And all along, you're looking at all these people. Or he's looking at reflections of who he could be if he continues to follow his way down the society path, which he detests. Sure. And, he's, and he decides to rebel completely against it. And I think that, like, actually making an active choice in his life, especially as a young like, teenager, is a big moment. Like, even if it was only, decide, even, even if it's rebellious, sorry, even if it was only in service to try to hit on these girls, essentially. Yeah. At least that's sort of implied right. there. This is the whole, not the whole, said. the whole point is that there is no actual. There's, there's not even really a. I guess the only reason is to hit on the girls, right? There, More I'm sure there have been other things in his life that involved him. But this did not in any way involve him. The, he's watching as these events unfold, and then because guess, of them, I mean, he I, decides to make a choice. I don't disagree with that, but I, 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 it's like the facts are there, but I, I, I think I just lean towards uh, calling him the protagonist. As I said, there's probably a lot of other causalities that cause him to quit his job, and you get hints of that. Yeah, like I said, it's sort of implied. Yeah. But you're, this is just the story of the last of straw. Yeah. And I mean, even if it's not a good reason or the best reason he did this, <laughs> it is the reason that caused him to make a choice. My argument has nothing or, to do with the choice, though. My argument, your argument is saying that he, nothing happens to him. My argument is that it's all about him actually deciding to have something happen. So I can see what okay. Sibo is saying as far as the three girls being the protagonist. Okay. But do you agree with it, though? Or what's your take? So... I would have agreed with him up until the last paragraph where he does describe that he's walking out to meet the girls and they're not there. And I do truly believe that that's the only reason he quit, just to go find and flirt with the girls to be the hero in the situation. But specifically because at the end of the story, he mentions, and my stomach kind of fell as I felt how hard the world was going to be on me hereafter. That's a good ending line. indeed. I, I would have to say that I think he was a protagonist no matter how indirectly a lot of the antagonizing sure. you know was to him think of it this way steve similar to a, a, a another cast another matsudo we've done he sort of chooses to become the protagonist even though he might not necessarily have been that beforehand well let me put it this way if i if i were to make him the protagonist i would have to give antagonist to zero Okay. Because I don't think he is antagonized by 
Lingle. They do it. I, well, I'm not going to give Antagonist zero because I don't think he's the protagonist. <laughs> they don't. I'm not going to. But they, they make a fucking choice, man. <laughs> I've, I've already made my choice. <laughs> Choose to quit. I've been telling you my choice this entire time. All right. That's Go fine. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that they are the ones that actually have something happen to them in this story. He is telling their story, essentially. So... I'm gonna give them a one. I I like right. I like you know. You know what I like. I, you make a good point. In fact, like I, I can both be to me fine. They're now both. They're sort of like sub protags, if you will. I'll give them all a one. Really, I think they're all well described and well done. I give them all zeros. <laughs> okay. All right. Well. All, one. all right, and we're on to supporting Wait, did, character. Did you, did you give your score, Veronica? Sorry. Mm, mar, mar. I forgot all about you. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll give it a one, even though I'm still undecided of who it is. Thank you, Stevo. I hate you. <laughs> so I suppose that Stokesy, yep. his friend, is a supporting character, and uh, the guy from the meat section and the old ladies in curlers. And the uh, register watcher, which. Uh, and the register watcher, which. I don't. <sighs> I don't know. I wasn't necessarily all that interested in any of them. They were just kind of... Well, they fill out the, the, the A&P world, I guess, yeah, if you want to call they, it. Yeah, they were kind of, you know, adding to the spectacle of the whole, yeah. you know, of the girls walking through the store. That was pretty much it. So, I, I don't know. I don't have too much to say about supporting characters. No, I pretty much agree. They're just props. Like, yeah, they're there. But if Langle is the antagonist and he's not secondary, so this the random crowd is there, sure. But that's about it. Yeah. Are all three of the girls considered? Are you considering protagonists or just Queenie? I put them as a group. Uh, of more, more so, just Queenie. I suppose I could do, make the other two supporting characters too. But again, they don't really do anything either. Yeah, they just—it's just fleshing out of the world. Yeah, I don't even think there's one supporting character I can point to to say this was an interesting yeah. right. addition to the world. Yeah, I think right. I agree with that. So it has to be a solid zero. I'm making a zero face, if you will. Yeah. Scott's making a zero face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'll join you guys. Why not? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll join the sheep. <laughs> the flock. Nice. Sheeple. Got it. So we're on to dialogue. Oh, it's me again. Okay. Um, Dialogue. Let's think. We have the... It's pretty sparse, I suppose. Yeah, yeah the only dialogue that I remember from the story took place when the... Manager came over. Not nah, well. He, uh, he speaks to narrator. Speaks to Stokesy real quickly about the girls, like two lines. Oh of- yes, but there wasn't much there. And at the very end, during the, I guess, confrontation. Yes. With the girls, that being the only real dialogue, as opposed to just internal dialogue. Right. I can't give it a one because it wasn't that strong. I mean, even what the manager is saying to the girls and her reaction are very simple, very small. Just, it's a very brief interaction. It, it says a lot, but at the same time, I think that what wasn't said, the looks of stares that are described are more impressive than the dialogue. Mm, I, I kind of probably agree with that. So I'll just read you the, the actual conversation because it's quite short. Uh, when he decides to quit, uh, as Lego says, I quit. Well, he says, I quit. And he says, did you say something, Sammy? I said, I quit. I thought you did. You didn't have to embarrass them, speaking about the girls. It was they who were, who were embarrassing us. I started to say something that came out fiddledy do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you know what you're saying, Lengel said. I know you don't, but I do. <laughs> that's, pretty, like, that's the entire There's, little confrontation. The issue is that when you're going to the themes of the story, impressive dialogue would not yes, cater to that's the... A good point. A realistic kind of world he's trying to portray. Yes, the inner dialogue of Sammy, the narrator, is impressive or very characterized. Yeah. But he sure. is, he's not in a way of like I w- like writers I know who say that I wish I could speak like I write, and I feel mm. that this character is the type that says like I can't actually uh, can can't address the world how I actually think about. Them. And I think that anything that was grandiose or would have been not in keeping with what this world was about, what the story was about. 
I mean, I agree with that, but I, I don't know if it's enough for me to give it a, a one. I, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a you, tough one. And if you also build off a kind of thing we've been doing lately with these stories, which is saying that, like, kind of the inner dialogue. Sure, the inner character, characterization. Character I get what you're saying. I think that... If I count that, then I, I probably would yeah. give it a one. So yeah. you might convince me on that. Like, since, since again, yes, it's in first person, so basically your s- description is through this character's eyes, then on that front, if I do indeed do that, then I will give it a one, I guess. I guess the spoken lines don't get it, but his, all his inner characterization monologue, I suppose, would. I guess I look at dialogue as kind of a measure of interaction, whether or not it's you know actual spoken lines in the uh, story or just a description of this character interaction that's happening. I can I can view that as dialogue, but I'm not sh- sure if his he does have a very rich inner thought process. Mm, I like that. Yeah. But I'm not sure if that goes towards interaction because he's only he's just thinking these things to himself. It's not like a description of his uh, interactions with any other character. So I don't know if I would count that as dialogue. Well, as I took uh, with my precedence when we did the Lich House, mm-hmm. you all disagreed with my viewpoint on the house having a great kind of inner dialogue. I think it was the only one to give a one for that. I'm going to keep my precedence. That's with completely having fair. In an inner narrative as counting for dialogue. I gotcha. think uh, uh, I think I'll try to be somewhat consistent, or at least start to, and uh, count it as such, and give it a one. I'm with you, E. That is to say. Thank you. So, I think I'm gonna. I do like the small little confrontation at the end, but I think I'm gonna stick with a zero on this one because that's not enough for me. All right. Also fair. I will actually agree with Sibo for once, and. <laughs> My God. Also That's say that it's, I know. <laughs> You're it's, embarrassing yourself. I uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, I'm going to give it a zero. I don't think, like you said, it, it did enough. I don't think that it was able to top the physical descriptions mm. of the reactions. I feel like that gave more of a dialogue or impression or... It itself vocalized certain impressions or ideas or opinions than the small amount of dialogue that was in the story. Mm, I got you. All right. <clears throat> We're on to style with myself. Now, this is, I recommended this story, and these type of slice of life, very, in a way, hyper realistic versions of the world are what appeal to me uh, in literature. And I have a very vivid image of the AMP in my mind, not only built off of AMPs I've experienced, <laughs> but off of the descriptions of this world. I can, like a movie, accurately picture every single interaction in this. And I mean, I, it's not meant to be stylish in the sense of being something super or beyond reality. This is simply a very focused lens of reality. Mm-hmm. And it captures that incredibly well. I can picture the the housewives rolling their cards down. I can picture these three young girls, depending on how young you want to make them. I kind of viewed them as older. But unless, Underage. Yeah. Well, however you want to view that. I think uh, I can still picture them walking down the aisle and getting the... I don't know. This, the style really worked for me. It, might, it probably won't work for everyone. But, again, I'm going to give it a one just on my opinion that's just like your opinion, man. Yeah. So this is a difficult one for me, too, because, yes, as you said, it's very true to life. Sure, can't argue with that. But I don't know if that means like it necessarily has a style that I like. And similar to as you said, um, referencing our Lich House episode, that it's, it's not maybe not quite a story for me. It's not that I didn't enjoy it, just that I'll probably forget about this story in a couple of days and not remember like much, if at all, anything about it. And again, not that the style was bad, but because it's so just like sort of down to earth, I guess, it's not dry. It's just that, yeah, here's a description and my character, you know, this character is like this. And here's a day in life of me working at A&P, my shitty job that I hate and three girls walk in. If I could give it a 0.5, I guess I would. But if I had to, if I have to round it to my own personal tastes, conversely, I would probably give it a zero. Yeah, but I, since you brought up, well, since we both brought up Glitch House, the idea is that do you appreciate the style of the piece of art, even if it's not a genre. Yeah, no, that I, you I like. get it. Sure, so that's, what I mean, like, that's, uh, that's what I'm saying. It's difficult, but maybe it's like the softest zero in the world, <laughs> really. But it just, I don't know. Like I said, if I want to forget this story, you know what I mean? What, if, if I hated it, then I remember that I hated it. But it's sort of like there for me. Yeah. So that, I think that's why I 
justify my zero in that sense. I'm kind of with you on this one, Ian. I really like the style that this is written in. In fact, I think it's probably this. My favorite part of it is the the type of writing that that went into this. It's kind of like like you said, the hyper real slice of life type of stuff, but written in a very clear, concise, and and stylized way. Even yeah, I don't agree that it's stylized, but I, I I guess I see what you mean. But there's not much for me to say. I, I I just like the way that it flowed. I also agree with Ian. I think that while it's very average compared to maybe other stories that we've covered on the podcasts, this is the kind of style that I appreciate. It's okay if it's an average day, but it's it's a certain interaction. It's a certain um, you know normalcy that if if I'm using that word correctly, yes. Um, that draws me in, and it is clear, like Sibo said. So I I enjoyed it, and it might not be the most memorable story, but it's certainly memorable in that I finished reading it, and then I actually went back and read it again, and then went over certain parts of it, mm. and certain things started sticking out, and then I started getting a bigger impression of it. Even though it's so simple, I'm getting bigger ideas. Sure, that's all fair. So I'll entitled. give it a one. Certainly entitled to. Okay, and what recommendations with Scott? So it's sort of like similar to what I just said, because of that fact. Like, I, I again, it's not it's not a bad story. I didn't dislike it, but it's just sort of like there. It's like sort of middle of the road to me. Yeah, it's a nice slice of life, but and again, that isn't quite my taste. So maybe I'm slightly biased about it. But if somebody said, and I also like to be fair or and and, and honest, uh, I haven't read much Updike in general. Also, I don't really know what his novels are like. Like, I know of him, but I've never actually read a lot of his works, or if any. This might be the, like, the thing I've read all the way through. I may flip through a couple of his novels here and there, like in my life. But if someone said, hey, should I read this Updike story? Uh, I'd be like, what, what was it again? Oh, yeah. I mean, guess. Maybe you might like it, but I, I wouldn't. I'm not like a spouting its um, merits, I suppose. So, again, it, this may be a softer zero, but at the end of the day, I'd be like, I have so many other things I could recommend instead of that. Even if someone said, what's the last story you read? I, this one probably wouldn't come up to my mind. I'd just think of other shit that I've probably read since then. So yeah, like, you know, not to say, like, to do it any discredit, it's just not for me. And I'd be like, eh, I'd probably just skip it, you know? Here's other stuff you might like instead. Yeah, I would say I'd rather be reading Bukowski, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, yeah. It's, it's not bad. It's not a bad way to spend... 15 minutes or And to be fair, it's it a quite a short story, yeah. so yeah, you can get through it pretty quickly and that's fine. Uh, but it's not I mean, I wouldn't I would I would recommend other things over over this short story for sure. I I haven't read that much John Updike either, but I have a feeling that some of his other longer form work is probably more interesting. Mm. So I'm probably going to give recommend a 0. I would recommend it. Listen, I'm not saying it's the strongest story. It was enough that I'll remember it. Again, it's in my the style that I like to read. Sure. And if you can spend 15 minutes watching The Housewives of New Jersey, you can definitely <laughs> spend 15 minutes reading this. And I'm sure you'll get much more out of this than oh, in an hour. And maybe that's that's not the best comparison. I'm not sure they have the same demographic, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, you'd be surprised. Uh, that's scary. But again, read this story and you'll realize why that's a little scary to say. Fair this enough. is your future if you're 19 or just well, turned 19. Could be your future, possibly. Yeah. If you're in this situation, I suppose, yes. And I recommended this story for the podcast, so I think that gives me an automatic <laughs> one for recommendation. Yep. I, I read this in a collection of short stories, like The Great American Author or something like that. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, it's good, and I think it's short enough that it's worth a read, especially if you are into, in a way, the realistic kind of looks at the world. If you're into like Bukowski, yeah. this is a nice kind of addendum on it. <laughs> it is worse. I like that's a good description, but I don't think you've convinced me to change my score. Yeah, but I mean, fair enough. So uh, I'll read out the scores now. Starting with the lowest with Scott and Stevo gave it a 6 each. Veronica gave it a 7 and I gave it an 8, giving a aggregate score of a 6.75. Sure. Respectable yeah. enough. Not bad. Sounds good. And this brings us to the conclusion of another Mat to Do About Nothing. I'm Jonathan Ian Manzer, here with Veronica Hernandez. Have a good night. Stephen Ramosi. Good night. And Scott Thaler. And I think I see three girls in bathing suits. I'm going to go quit my job and go hit on them. All right, bye. Mat to Do 
Matsudo About Nothing. Matsudo About Nothing. Music by Chris Morgan. Editing and engineering by Stephen Ramos. Matsudo About Nothing. This has been a Lost Signals production. All rights reserved.